Thank you for joining us today for this discussion of best practices for collections for associations. Um, this session is going to be geared towards our DC clients, but best practices for collections can be universal. So um, Dan and Brad will let you know when we're talking DC specific things. Um, so as always, the webinar will be recorded and posted on our website for you to review and share with your colleagues on your boards. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll bring them up as appropriate. And at the end, we have left some time for Q&A. So at the end of it, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you, you and you can ask live questions. So we are pleased to be joined today by Brad Barna and Dan Blom from Chadwick, Washington, Moriarty, Elmar and Bunn PC. Brad is a senior associate attorney with Chadwick, Washington. His practice is devoted to representing DC and Virginia community associations in such matters as corporate governance and procedure, reviewing contract, contracts and resolving contract disputes and covenant and ruled interpretation and drafting. Brad also provides litigation services to, to the firm's clients, including representing community associations in assessment collection and covenant enforcement cases, as well as warranty claims and general defense. Brad is an active member of the Washington Metropolitan Chapter of Community Associations Institute, including on its DC Legislat Legislative Action Committee, and provides education and seminars to managers and directors on a variety of topics in impacting community associations. Dan is a senior associate with Chadwick Washington in Fairfax, Virginia. His practice is devoted to the representation of community associations throughout Virginia and the District of Columbia, including covenants and rules enforcements, collections, governing document interpretation and amendments, corporate governance, contract disputes and contract negotiation and drafting. He is an active member of the Washington Metropolitan Chapter of the Community Associations Institute, including four years of service on the quorum editorial committee. So thank you guys for joining us today. And I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Dan and Brad for their presentation. Sure. Thank you, Mira. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite, quite the mouthful there introducing us. <laughs> I guess we've been, been around for a little while at this point. Uh, but yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Brad Barna. I'm with the Chat of Washington. I'll be joined here shortly by my colleague, Dan Blum. Uh, we're here to discuss DC collections, best practices, uh, and remedies that you may have, uh, both your legal remedies through the uh, um, courts, uh, but also your uh, remedies outside the courts, so your administrative and non-legal remedies. Uh, before we get into it, though, uh, we are lawyers, so we do need to provide a disclaimer. Uh, we uh, our lawyers, we may not be your lawyers. The information that we provide to you here today is intended to be educational uh, and informational and is not meant to be uh, legal advice uh, to your association or to your specific situation. Um, so keeping that in mind, uh, we will get into the very interesting and very important uh, topic of a collection of assessments for associations. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to remind you all as, as managers and, and board members uh, of the importance of assessments, but we, we do like to kind of explain the why, why you should pay attention to this. Um, of course, I'm probably talking to the choir because you're all here on a webinar focused on this. Uh, but assessments are very important to associations. You've got uh, all those higher purposes that associations are, are, are tasked with um, maintaining um, facilities, um, maintaining services, uh, making sure generally that the uh, association facilities uh, and building are, are kept up to standards and kept safe. So those assessments obviously allow the association uh, to perform all those tasks uh, so long as you have that cash flow coming in. Uh, obviously, they, they say money can't buy happiness, and that's probably true in an association setting, uh, but lack of money will certainly lead to unhappiness uh, in an association setting. Uh, we're all aware generally of the impact of budget deficiencies. All of those services uh, that I mentioned uh, either become fewer and far between or perhaps uh, fall off completely, or you have to settle for uh, perhaps lesser vendors. Uh, when you have those budget deficiencies, uh, what do you do to make up for those? Well, you may end up having to pass those deficiencies caused by delinquencies onto your uh, paying members. Um, those folks that you know have, have been paying the whole time uh, may end up having to pay more than their fair share in order to make up for those uh, who are not. Uh, in a worst case scenario, you may end up uh, having to assess a special assessment uh, to make up for those budget deficiencies. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, that's a often a large chunk of change, kind of a last resort, but uh, it, it all starts somewhere, and often it comes from escalating delinquencies. Uh, if you do have to do a special assessment or you find out that your finances are, are not quite in order, that has knock-on effects. Um, for example, lenders uh, are less likely to uh, grant loans uh, to purchase units within a condominium if when they see those financial documents uh, and they're not exactly in top shape, uh, a lender may not be willing to back that sale up. And of course, that has the knock-on effect of suppressing uh, the, the pool of potential purchasers and therefore depressing your property values, which of course is the original purpose of a lot of these uh, associations to make sure that the communities uh, maintain value uh, and are uh, appealing to others. So you wanna stay on top of your uh, collections efforts on behalf of the association. Uh, the first thing that we look to when, uh, when, when collecting assessments on the behalf of an association is what their authority is to collect those assessments. Uh, and that authority comes from a variety of places. Uh, DC law is top of the list here. Um, as Mira mentioned, uh, this uh, webinar is focused on DC. Uh, so when we talk about the, um, the, the applicable laws, the applicable time periods, uh, and the, the specific procedures for, um, for executing your various collections remedies, uh, we are referring specifically to DC. Of course, when we talk about kind of uh, your best practices, uh, more generally, those can apply to associations in other jurisdictions, uh, such as Virginia and, and likely Maryland as well. But DC law is what we're focused on here today. So that's kind of the top, uh, the top of this list. Uh, DC law may authorize you to take action. Uh, it may limit you to take a from taking action in certain cases. Uh, it depends on the circumstance. Um, the next item on this list is the declaration uh, of covenants uh, for your condominium or your HOA. This will lay out um, some of your collection authority, um, you know, how much interest you can charge, um, various other responsibilities um, of the owners, what, what costs they may be liable for, what you can assess them for, uh, and so on. Uh, the bylaws. Uh, similarly, may have some additional collections uh, authority or collections procedures uh, in them that you're required to follow. Uh, and then at the bottom there are the rules and regulations um, that can be adopted um, in compliance with the declaration and bylaws. Uh, important to note there that your declaration and bylaws uh, will control, so you can't uh, create rules and regulations that directly conflict with your declaration and bylaws. Um, so when you are looking at making a collections resolution, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, make sure the provisions that you want to see in there uh, are not directly conflicted uh, by those documents. We mentioned we'll talk about uh, both your legal and your non-legal remedies. Uh, first, I'll touch on the uh, non-legal remedies, your administrative collections remedies. Uh, in DC, you do have a, a few that are available to you. Um, suspension of voting rights or rights to serve on a board of directors. Um, DC code specifically authorizes uh, an association, a condo association to suspend the voting rights of members who are delinquent for more than 30 days. Uh, for some owners that may mean something, for others it may not, but it is something that is out there that can be used to uh, enforce uh, against delinquencies. Uh, with the right to serve on the board, uh, DC law doesn't specifically touch on that, but your documents may, those declarations and bylaws that I mentioned uh, on the last slide. Uh, aside from the uh, right to vote or serve on a board, uh, you may be able to suspend uh, a delinquent owner's rights to use facilities and services provided by the association. Uh, the board can adopt you know, reasonable rules and restrictions um, that impose these suspension rights. Uh, you may have to provide certain levels of due process uh, to a delinquent owner prior to suspending them. Um, that might include giving them notice of the delinquency, giving them an opportunity to cure it, uh, and in, in some instances, giving them a, an opportunity uh, for a hearing. Uh, 
Hey, Brad, quick question that just occurred to me. Sure. When you're referring to a delinquency, is that assessments only or can fines or repairs or things like that be, be considered if you're looking to suspend a, um, a rights? Yeah, good, good, good question. Uh, typically, they're, they're going to be included. Once, once a charge from the association is assessed against a unit owner, uh, it becomes an assessment. Um, so while there are different characterizations of assessments, whether they be fines or repair charges, all of that is generally going to fall under the definition of uh, assessment that we're kind of trying to collect here. Uh, that said, your documents may have some unique uh, twists to them that for some reason separate those out and give different different remedies for collecting those apart from regular assessments. But generally, yes, those are included. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, one last point on the suspension of rights. Um, of course, if you don't have facilities that that maybe people would want access to, you know, if you don't have um, common element parking, if you don't have pools, gyms, other types of facilities like that, it, it may be of limited use to you. Uh, two other kind of administrative ways that you can collect uh, the resale disclosure package uh, that each uh, seller of a condominium unit in DC is supposed to obtain from the association and give to the buyer, uh, that will include uh, the balance uh, on any assessment account. And so making sure that those resale packages include all the amounts that an, uh, an owner owes uh, is a good way to get those paid uh, at the closing. Uh, if it's not paid at closing, then the new owner uh, is responsible for paying those as well. Uh, and the last one here on this list, uh, the DC Housing Assistance Fund. This is a new, relatively new um, fund that was created by the DC Council, essentially to assist DC homeowners in paying uh, their mortgages and associated costs, including condominium and HOA fees. Um, so if owners are um, struggling um, to pay their assessments, they may qualify for this. Uh, the qualifications, I think, uh, start at you know, income of $100,000. So you may be able to, um, owners may be able to qualify for that, even if they're far away from qualifying through other uh, types of assistance. But so those are just some uh, summary of kind of the administrative collections remedies that we typically see. Uh, there may be others that your documents provide for, uh, and an attorney can help you look through that. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Dan to discuss the, uh, the legal side of things. Dan? Thanks, Brad, for that excellent intro, um, including the administrative collection procedures that may be available. Um, thanks to Mira and EJF for having us here today to talk about these important issues. Um, I am going to jump right in and start talking about your legal collections remedies. So there comes a point uh, where the administrative collections remedies that are available to you are not working, are not effective, and you have delinquent owners uh, that continue to not pay and be a problem for your associations. Um, at some point, you will want to consider referring accounts over to legal counsel. Um, there are three things uh, that, that you need to think about um, when you're getting ready to turn accounts over to legal counsel. The first being, well, what does legal counsel actually need uh, in order to move on these accounts, which I will address in the next slide. Uh, the second point here is timing. Um, it's important to be aware of deadlines. And in particular, I'm talking about the three-year statute of limitations for collecting on delinquent assessments. In order to collect on delinquent assessments, um, a lawsuit must be filed within three years from when the initial assessment became due. So you don't want to sit on these accounts for, for a long time before getting them into legal counsel's hands. Um, otherwise, you may have problems collecting the older debt. Um, third point noted here is specific for DC condos. There is a notice of intent to take legal action that's required to be sent under the DC Condo Act, provided the um, citation there uh, for you to look up on your free time but uh, I'll show you an example of what that looks like in a couple slides. So what does your legal counsel need? A lot of this stuff your legal counsel will already have uh, before receiving a turnover. 
So typically, uh, we already have your governing documents, your declaration, bylaws, collections resolution, if there is one. We already know the legal name of your association. Um, so the things that we need are the account number uh, for the debtor, if there is one, an itemized accounting of the amount to be claimed, including not just the assessment principal, but also any interest fees or other charges, um, violation charges, repair charges, et cetera, um, showing, showing the account history back to a zero balance. Um, and then we'll need copies of correspondence with the debtor. And for DC condos, uh, that includes the required language under the Condo Act, uh, which looks like this. So you'll see it says at the top, failure to pay past due amounts may result in legal action, including foreclosure. And then it provides a couple resources for owners to, to look at. Um, moving forward, um, one of the first things um, our firm does in our collections procedure is to secure the debt through assessment liens. This is a way to um, secure the debt against the property rather than going against the individual. So an assessment lien essentially is securing the debt against the unit or property, and it can trigger payment when the lot or unit is sold or refinanced. Um, this is a very useful tool to um, allow the association to get in line with other potential creditors. And if and when there is a sale or refinance of the property, um, typically, the title company will require that the liens that are recorded against the property are satisfied in order to clear title. Um, so this is a cost-effective way uh, to secure the debt um, against the property. Um, it's one of the first things we'll do because it is cost-effective and it gets you in line among other creditors. Um, in D.C., there is a, a concept of an automatic lien and uh, for DC condos, a super lien for the most recent six months of condo assessments. What a super lien is, is it allows the association to jump ahead of other creditors, potentially. Um, there, there has been some recent case law in DC that affects this super lien, which Brad will talk about in a few minutes. Um, but for now, the super lien still exists by statute and can, in some instances, be um, an effective way to put pressure on debtors to make payment. Um, another good thing about assessment liens is that generally they survive a bankruptcy. Um, and the reason for that is because it is securing it again against the property, not the individual. When an individual files for bankruptcy, um, they may be entitled to relief from debt that they owe personally, but that debt that's secured against real property typically will survive the bankruptcy discharge if the debtor is entitled to one. It also allows the association to be considered a secured creditor in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy where a debtor is uh, on a payment plan. Um, the association can get in line and be entitled to payments through the Chapter 13 bankruptcy trustee according to the approved plan in that case. Um, so again, it's a very useful tool uh, to allow the associations to secure the debt. Um, also, the liens are the basis to foreclose on, on a property. So having those in place leaves open the option to foreclosure if and when the circumstances present themselves for that to be a good option, um, which Brad will talk about foreclosure in a, in a couple minutes. Um, I talked about deadlines before for liens. Um, it's also three years, so you can enforce liens um, back three years. There is a little bit of a tolling period for COVID uh, to extend that a little bit, but generally speaking, it's a three-year period. Hey, Daniel, can you just take a minute and, and talk a little bit more in detail about the tolling? Because I know that was a big issue within the industry, certainly for managers to understand what that did for extending dates, but I think also for the board members that are on here, sort of helping them understand that. Yes, thanks, Scott. That's a good question. So um, it's basically a math problem. And one way to think about it is 
the statute of limitations was paused in March 2020, and then it was unpaused in September 2022. So it depends on when the debt became due. Um, and then you do a calculation from that date. You calculate basically three years from that date, see where that, that falls. If it falls within the tolling period, you can add the amount of time from March 2020, 2020 to the end of September 2022 uh, to extend the, the statute of limitations period. If that sounded complicated, it's because it is a little bit complicated, but that's, if anybody's a real math whiz out there, uh, you may have followed along, um, but that's the general gist of it. Basically, statute of limitations got paused in March 2020 and unpaused in September 2022. Does that does that make sense, Scott? I know it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist. So, so I stink at math, and so yeah. maybe you could give a hypothetical. You know, just throw out some dates or you know, type of thing. It, it, they went. So let's just say the lien was filed. Uh, let's just say October of 2019. Okay, so, so October 2019. Three years from that would be. October of 22. Very good. So then, um, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but then we can add the period of time from March through September to the end of that. Is that is that your understanding, Brad? Right. Essentially, yeah, the, the three-year statute of limitations for that October 2019 assessment started running then, uh, and then about uh, six six months later, or so, Just call it six months to make it yeah, easy. Six months later, it got paused, uh, and and then you know when it got unpaused on September thirtieth, twenty twenty two, it started ticking again. So you, you've already used up six months of your three years. So now you've got from September thirtieth, twenty twenty two, another two years and six months to enforce the lien on that October uh, twenty nineteen um, assessment. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for the assist, Brad. Sure. All right. Good question, Scott. That That is a good one, and, and it certainly comes up from time to time. It has in the past year or so, for sure. All right. Okay, so here's a little flow chart, um, basically outlining the assessment collection process from our perspective as lawyers. Um, the accounts referred to us, our office would then uh, do some background work to verify ownership and title to the property, do a bankruptcy search to see if the debtor recently filed bankruptcy, which could affect how we proceed, um, and then confirm the accounting. So review the accounting from your management team um, according to what your authority is in your governing documents and make sure it's all squared away. The next thing we would do is send out a validation notice of the debt, um, which is required under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, giving the debtor 30 days to dispute the debt before we can take additional legal action. If they do not dispute the debt within that 30 days, we can move forward. If they do dispute the debt, Typically, what we have to do is send what's called a verification letter, which means we go back to uh, the board and or management to confirm that the charges are accurate and then send this verification letter to the debtor confirming that we've verified it and it's accurate. Um, then we can proceed with the collections actions of a lien warning letter, followed by the lien, which I talked about, which has to be executed by the president and then filed with the land records. If an owner still doesn't pay after that, the next step is to uh, proceed to a lawsuit to collect uh, against the person personally. Um, so filing a lawsuit, this is a formal proceeding filed in court. Uh, we have to get service on the individual um, and this initiates the process to get a judgment against them personally. Uh, in D.C., we have two courts that we typically use, the Small Claims Division and the D.C. Superior Court. The Small Claims Division has a uh, jurisdictional limit of $10,000. Uh, 
So anything over that amount, we'd have to go to the superior court. Um, obtaining a, mo a money judgment against the owner gives the association additional tools to try to collect that debt. Um, Brad will talk about post-judgment collections efforts in a moment, but generally speaking, it, it allows the association to attach assets, garnish bank accounts, garnish wages, et cetera. Um, your association uh, likely also has authority to collect attorney's fees against the debtor when you file a lawsuit. We look to the declaration and bylaws as well as statutory authority for that. Um, there's some case law in DC that potentially limits what you can recover to 15% um, of the principal, um, although there is some question on that issue, but that's something to be aware of that courts do tend to limit the amount of attorney's fees. The, the court, the judge has uh, discretion to determine what they think is reasonable in most cases. Um, so that's something to be aware of that you can recover some attorney's fees likely, but usually not all. Um, another good thing about judgments, other than being able to collect against an individual's assets, is that it will survive a foreclosure. So if, a, if an owner gets foreclosed on, um, the association still has options to collect that debt, even though that owner no longer owns in the association. You can still pursue uh, wage garnishments, bank garnishments, et cetera, because you have a judgment against them as an individual, which again is different than the assessment lien, which is against the property. So those are the two ways you can go after the debt from a legal standpoint is against the property through assessment liens and foreclosure or through uh, money judgment against the individual. This is a little flow chart um, explaining um, the differences between small claims court and superior court in DC. The short version here is that small claims court is a little bit faster, has fewer procedural hurdles, so it will typically be less expensive and less time consuming, but again, it has that $10,000 limit. So if there's a debt that's over that amount, you're going to have to go to Superior Court, which usually takes more time and money and effort. And with that, I will turn it back over to Brad. Thanks, Dan. So uh, again, once you complete those procedures in either the small claims or the Superior Court, you've got a judgment. Uh, and of course, those all get paid immediately, uh, or so we would wish. Uh, but unfortunately, that's that's not the case. And getting a judgment is just kind of the first step um, in the legal process to getting paid. Um, but what a judgment does allow you to do, as Dan mentioned, is attach to the assets uh, of the debtor. And there's a few ways to do that, a few different types of assets you can attach to. Uh, wage garnishments will allow you to uh, attach to a debtor's income. Uh, so if you can find out where they work, uh, you can have their employer served uh, with a wage garnishment where the court will order them to withhold uh, a certain amount of their wages uh, to then satisfy the judgment that you have. Uh, a bank garnishment uh, is another option. If you can find out where an owner banks, uh, for example, on the checks they send to the association, or if there's some sort of um, uh, automatic payment information that you that you can get a hold of, uh, you can have the court order the bank to uh, take whatever funds are in their accounts up to the amount of the judgment that you have uh, and turn those over to the association to satisfy that judgment. Uh, another option uh, is a rent garnishment. Uh, if the debtor has tenants uh, either in the uh, condo unit or, or, um, or lot or uh, another um, condo unit or lot within the city, uh, you can uh, have the court order that tenant to start paying their rent to the court uh, to eventually be turned over uh, to the association uh, for payment. Uh, if the debtor has assets that are located outside of DC uh, that we track down, uh, we may be able to take that judgment and uh, get it domesticated uh, in whatever state they have assets. Uh, there's a formal process to do that, essentially turn a DC judgment into, for example, a Virginia judgment, and then you can do some of these similar items. Um, 
You'll notice though that all of these kind of require us to have some information. Uh, we need to know where they work, uh, where they bank, uh, if they have any tenants. Um, if we don't have that information, it, it, we can't really do these. Uh, we may be able to get a, a per private investigator to, to locate some of this information, but always easiest uh, if we can get it straight from the board or management. Uh, if we don't get that information uh, from uh, the board or management or a private investigator, we do also have the ability to bring a debtor into court to require them to answer uh, questions about their finances and their assets. Uh, of course, uh, they may not be entirely forthcoming, uh, or if they tell us the truth, uh, they may then turn around and move their assets, uh, which can obviously hinder the association's collections efforts. So um, best is to not put them on notice uh, via those uh, uh, calling them into court to answer questions uh, if we can avoid it. Uh, and keeping with our flow charts, we've got another flow chart here kind of describing the various ways um, that you can uh, collect a judgment. Uh, you will get copies of these slides, so um, no need to, to strain your eyes or anything here and, and read through these quickly. Um, but again, information is key here. All right, here, here's the big one. Uh, foreclosure. Uh, foreclosure is another remedy that you have. Uh, you can do it both, uh, both non-judicially uh, where you uh, essentially do a, a private auction, uh, or you can do it judicially where you uh, file a lawsuit in the DC Superior Court uh, asking the court to enter an order uh, for sale. Uh, DC foreclosure law is kind of in flux uh, at this point. Um, years ago, uh, DC foreclosures by condominium units were, were a great tool uh, to get uh, the association's uh, assessments paid, um, if not by the owner, then by the uh, holder of the first deed of trust, uh, because the association had uh, that super lien that Dan uh, mentioned earlier, which allowed you to essentially jump in front of all other creditors uh, for those most recent six months of, of assessments. So mortgagees would often pay that uh, simply to make sure that they were first in line um, to the title. Uh, there's been a number of significant changes to the Condo Act uh, and also case law in DC that has kind of impacted the efficacy uh, of those foreclosures, uh, including uh, a just recent ruling where essentially any federally backed mortgage, uh, for example, those um, held by Fannie or Freddie, uh, are not subject to DC's super lien provisions. Um, and so we may not be able to do that anymore for those mortgages. Uh, the question is, how do we know which mortgages are federally backed? And the answer is that, that we don't, uh, unless a debtor gives us permission uh, to find out. And of course, a debtor is very unlikely to give permission to the association to do anything that would help the association uh, foreclose. Uh, so... That is basically applies to non-judicial foreclosures of the super lien. Um, because of those issues with DC foreclosures currently, uh, we are finding more and more that judicial foreclosure is the cleaner uh, and safer option, although more expensive. Um, with that in mind, when we're looking at whether a, a uh, unit is a good candidate foreclosure, we do need to keep that cost in mind and it causes us to recommend foreclosure typically only for higher balances um, and properties that will uh, create enough of a sales price to um, pay off all the liens, all the mortgagees, and for to have there be enough to cover uh, the association's attorney's fees and costs. And so a number of things go into that, you know, uh, what other liens are on the property? Uh, is there a clear title to the property? Um, is the unit occupied? What condition is the unit in? All of that plays in uh, to the foreclosure calculus. Um, foreclosure is uh, kind of a very complicated process, uh, especially with these uh, recent developments in DC. Um, I've tried to explain it kind of in, in broad terms. Uh, if it sounds complicated, uh, it's because it is. Um, definitely consult with, um, with your association's counsel if you're, if you're considering foreclosure. 
All right, so we'll we'll end it with a with a little top five list of uh, of best practices, and then we'll open it up to uh, to questions. Uh, top five number one is uh, adopt a collections resolution uh, and follow it. I mentioned those rules and regulations at the outset. Um, adopting a collections resolution can streamline your collections process uh, and make certain things automatic. It can clarify when notices will go out. It can provide default instructions to management and your attorneys about how accounts should be handled. Uh, and essentially it will kind of allow the professionals to do what's in the best interest of the association. Um, once you have one in place though, of course you wanna follow it. Uh, one of the things judges hate to see is a policy in place that was not uh, adhered to, uh, and that can cause them to um, favor a, a debtor in court. Dan, number two. All right, number two, keep accurate and timely accounting records. This is very important. You all on this call are with EJF, so I'm sure you're all good here, no worries, but it is something important to keep in mind, um, especially if and when accounts get turned over to legal counsel, we need those records to be absolutely accurate and timely um, recorded and because if and when we get before a judge, um, we need to have everything straight. Um, so before it gets to us, just make sure all your, all your documents are in order, everything looks right um, because this is something that um, takes our paralegals some time, some time to figure out if there are problems and that can slow things down. So um, again, EJF has you handled here, but this is just something to keep in mind that accurate accounting is very important in collections. Brad, number three. All right, uh, be reasonable and practical uh, on payment plans. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, um, the wish is that everybody would pay everything that they owe all at once, uh, but for one reason or other, uh, owners haven't. Uh, and um, they may not be able to pay all at once, but they may be able to pay uh, some or over a period of time. Um, money coming in is a good thing. And uh, all those efforts that you make to collect uh, will have their cost to the association, uh, either in legal fees, management fees, uh, board uh, time, uh, all of that comes into play. So uh, be reasonable and practical. Um, you don't have to accept every payment plan, but again, the goal here is to is to be cost effective, and sometimes uh, a payment plan is is the most cost effective means. Dan, all right, number four, do not try to collect outside of your authority. Courts frown upon this, and for good reason. Um, so again, this is something that um, when we get uh, turnover accounts in our office we check to make sure that you have authority for what you're charging. Um, so make sure that you don't go outside of the authority because it will slow things down. Um, and if we get to the point somehow we miss it or whatever and it ends up in front of a court, that's not gonna look good. It gives the debtor um, more ammunition to try to fight and look better in front of the judge. So um, be aware of what you are allowed to collect and not allowed to collect. Um, if you have questions, ask your management team, ask your lawyers. Um, we're here to help, rely on your professionals. Um, it's important not to be charging your owners for things that they should not be charged for. I mean, that, that should go without saying, but um, you have to be fair and consistent with these things. And it's just a bad look to be trying to charge things to owners that you really don't have authority to charge. So again, Talk to your professionals if you have questions. Your management team's there to help. Your lawyers are there to help. Um, so please rely on them. Brad, number five. All right, this is a, another another good one. Uh, communicate early and often uh, with debtors. Um, often we'll we'll get turnovers from from other management companies that say uh, those debtors are contacted by us and they'll say this is the first time that I'm hearing about this, uh, and, and that can often you know be a significant issue. Um, if the association is incurring attorney's fees, management fees to collect these accounts, uh, and the owner would have paid much earlier if they'd only known, uh, then, then that's obviously something that we want to avoid. Um, so communicate early and often with debtors. Uh, you've, you've probably got some notice provisions 
that collections resolution that you adopt is likely to provide certain notices to the owners. You know, we want to make sure that we're keeping owners' addresses up to date and accurate. Of course, that's their responsibility. But once we get that information, we want to make sure that it's reflected in the association records. Um, and this can just help help avoid having to turn over to legal or incur additional fees for management or, or your 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 law firm. So um, make sure that those notices are getting out to the owners. Uh, if you have email addresses for them, you know certainly they can be contacted there uh, by either management or or directors as a friendly reminder to try and head off uh, any further further efforts. Um, and of course, you know if, as we mentioned earlier, looking good in front of a judge. Uh, if if an owner comes in and says, you know, I never knew about this until you know I got served with a lawsuit, uh, you know, a judge may not uh, view uh, the case as kindly as they would. Uh, if the owner had been, been given ample opportunity to pay before a lawsuit. And it's helpful in that situation to have a stack of documents to show the judge all the notices and emails that were sent to the owner to say, actually, there were plenty of notices sent. And then that makes the debtor look bad in front of the judge. So it's good to have that papered and, and well documented so that we're prepared for that, um, because that is that is a fairly typical uh, debtor line to say that they had no idea, nobody ever told them, so. So a, a question came in just now, um, who should communicate with the debtors? Is it management or board members? So management is is typically going to be the one uh, that, that handles these accounts and communicates with the debtors, uh, both uh, in writing or if they call in to, to find out about their account. Um, now the board, you know, may be able to take a more proactive approach um, if we we have doubts that people are are receiving notices. You know, perhaps a, a director can do a friendly reminder. Not not something that we typically recommend, um, but but in in, in certain instances it, it may be may be appropriate. Now once an account gets turned over to legal counsel, uh, the communications should be coming from the attorney. Uh, one of the issues that, that we often see is, um, is confusion by owners uh, about what they owe because they may see a balance on management's you know, website that says one thing, um, but the actual balance uh, that's at the attorney's office is higher because that includes the most up-to-date you know, late fees, charges, um, attorney's fees balance, all of that stuff that we want the association to, to get. Um, so those those demand letters and information about accounts should then come from the attorney once it's been turned over. Uh, and any inquiries to management should be directed uh, to the uh, legal counsel. And then we we do have uh, a few of our co-op co owners on the line. Can you touch on what's available to co-ops that may not be available to condos? Sure. Well, so yeah, co-ops uh, obviously a little bit different for those that aren't aware what co-ops are. Essentially, a a owner instead of purchasing their unit, they purchase shares in the uh, in the entity that owns the building and those shares correspond with the unit and entitle them to live to live there. Uh, but essentially uh, DC law treats co-op owners as tenants. And so uh, we discussed earlier those those suits in the DC uh, small claims court. instead of going to small claims, we would go to DC landlord tenant court. Uh, and essentially sue for the equivalent of uh, unpaid rent uh, and uh, potentially uh, an order to, to evict them and remove them from uh, membership in, in the co-op. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the option for, for co-ops for enforcement. Um, there, there aren't really liens because they don't they don't technically own um, that that property um, that they live in. Um, okay, Melanie, you've got your hand raised, so I've asked you if you want to unmute. Oh. Melanie, can you unmute? Unmuted? There you are. Hi. Okay. Um. Most of our co-owners that have share loans you are, have them with lenders that use what's called the DC Standard Recognition Agreement. Um, 
And in the DC standard recognition agreement, there is language that keeps the assessments primary for three months worth of assessments, after which the lender then becomes primary. Um, do you have any information about whether that is something that is enforced um, or how that would change your approach to landlord tenant court? Well, so yeah, I mean, you may be able to to make a demand um, of the of the lender there for the most recent three months. Again, there there may be other options short of landlord tenant court there, but it'll depend on the specifics of of the agreement there. Uh, so you may be able to to use that and kind of avoid having to to go to court if you can get those payments. Of course, that's only the first the first three months there. Um, if they have a a larger debt that goes back further. Uh, then you may, may need to go to the landlord tenant court in order to get that judgment uh, to then allow you to collect uh, using those same methods, the um, wage, bank, and rent garnishments that, that we talked about. Yes. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, without looking at the specific agreement, that may be a good situation for um, your management team to send a letter to the lender notifying them of the delinquency and seeing if there may not be a payment arrangement available for those three months. But again, three months is not, um, it's not all that long of a time. So um, you may end up having to go to landlord tenant or somebody who's more seriously delinquent, um, which again, you can, you can sue for that back rent um, and, and get an order of eviction that way. But yeah, that's an interesting point, Melanie. Thanks for bringing that up. Question in the chat, should management account balance and legal account balance match after the account comes out of collections? Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, so uh, a little bit of our process, when we do get, for example, a final payment in, uh, we will send it over to management along with a um, list of uh, account adjustments, uh, which management should then make. And essentially uh, those adjustments uh, applied to the account along with that final payment should end up at, at either a zero balance or a balance that only reflects uh, assessments that have come due since uh, that payment was made to bring the account uh, fully current. Um, so, so yes, they, they, should, they should match up and reconcile um, after the account has been closed, unless, or as long as it's been paid in full. Um, if an account is, is brought out of collections, um, there may be some additional reconciliation work that needs to be done. Uh, sorry, brought out of collections without first being paid in full. Uh, there may need to be some additional reconciliation, uh, but generally, yes, they, they should match up. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, any other hands raised, so I'm going to do my normal last call for questions. Um, let's see. If an owner claims that assessments are being calculated incorrectly, how would that affect the collections process? Well, uh, I'll take that one, Brad. It sure. depends on uh, whether there's any merit to what they have to say. Um, if there's no merit to what they have to say, then the collections procedure is the same. Um, if they do have a legitimate uh, challenge or issue with what's going on, then you'd have to look at the specifics of the situation and see what the deal is and how to handle it appropriately. Um, but uh, just having them, an owner claim to management or the board that they don't think the assessments are right doesn't automatically um, mean that your collection stops right there. Brad, what do you think? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, it depends on what exactly their their gripe is. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, when accounts get turned over to us, you know, we review to make sure that every, all the calculations are accurate uh, and that everything is within the association's authority. Uh, we are uh, debt collectors under federal law when we are uh, collecting these assessments. And so uh, we incur li liability to the debtor if we, as a law firm, uh, uh, send them incorrect demands or confusing demands, anything like that. So, so we certainly have practices in place to make sure that everything that we are um, sending to them uh, is, is accurate. Um, but if there's something, I guess, on the association side, again, we need, we need to address it on a case-by-case -case basis. Let me just jump in here for one second too and say that 
you know, part of it will depend on how long the client has been with EJF as a client. Um, we as a company provide our attorneys that we work with with direct access into our software. So they can very easily go in and see, hey, uh, something does look a little weird on this account or everything looks copacetic. There's no payment showing for the last six months. So yes, they're delinquent. And so, um, you know, if it's an issue where a association has come over to us as the management company, come to EJF recently, you know, and the, the, the issue goes back to the prior management company or even two management companies ago, then it gets a little harder both for the attorneys and for EJF to, you know, work through that. And a lot of times we will need to push back on the owner uh, and say, if you had a balance with the prior company or two companies ago, you're going to have to dig up the documentation to support all of that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Yeah, that oftentimes uh, going from management company to management company, that's where you get some of these issues about um, changing accounting practices. Um, one company may do it differently than another. Uh, you know, these balances, you know, when they get turned over, need to be reconciled and 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 matched up. We may end up having, you know, if it if the debt is old enough two, three, four different management company uh, ledgers that we need to show to go back to a zero balance. Um, and of course that can get a little bit complicated. There's room for error, but you know we have all those practices at our firm and of course EJF does as well to, to root those out. Someone's asked if we can give a rough timeline for the process of collection. I know that you know there's certain certain amounts of notices that have to be given. So if we could run through a bit of that. Sure, well, and, and it'll it'll depend you know a little bit on what the what the board's preference is. Your collections resolution will typically uh, provide instruction to management about when to turn an account over. You know whether it's 90 days uh, after first delinquency, 120 days, whatever the case may be. Um, so those that will change a little bit. But once once it's been turned over to us, you know we we open the account within um, you know a week or so. Get out that validation notice that gives them 30 days. Um, if applicable, you know, get out that lien notice letter and record the lien relatively soon there. Uh, and then the next step in terms of lawsuit uh, is a little bit more of a gray area. Uh, we want to do a lawsuit in a cost-effective manner. And so if, if, you, if your association has relatively low assessments, um, you know, a few hundred dollars a year, uh, it may not make sense to go straight to a judgment. Uh, where we may only get, you know, a small percentage of, of attorney's fees, or, or if we get, you know, 20% of attorney's fees on a, on a small balance, it's, it's nothing close to what the association actually incurred. So there may be certain instances where it makes sense to allow the assessments to build up uh, before filing a lawsuit, but certainly those liens are done relatively quickly. Uh, and then, of course, it, it depends on, on when an owner might pay. Um, I guess, if once you do get to a lawsuit, uh, as Dan mentioned, there's there's two two courses of action. There's the small claims court, which can take you know uh, a few months, uh, and then there's the um, superior court, which can you know take closer to to a year or so. Um, and again, the, the delineation there is claims under ten thousand go to the small claims, claims over ten thousand have to go to um, to Superior Court, and and that ten thousand dollar number is just the principal balance on the account. So the assessments and late fees, it doesn't include attorneys' fees or costs or anything like that. Um, okay. Um, well, we're getting close to an hour. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I will say thanks to everyone who attended. Um, this was, I thought, a really nice webinar, and thank you, Dan and Brad, for all of your knowledge. Um, next month, third, third, third Thursday of March, we will be doing a session on emergency management. So information will go out on that um, as soon as we have it. And we will post this recording hopefully this week and we'll send a notice to all our boards when it's posted. So thanks again, Brad and Dan. This was a great session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. Happy to share. Thanks, Mira. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody.